Good afternoon. I am Rod Hicks. I am journalist on call for the Society of Professional Journalists. And I want to welcome you to our continuation of uh, Truth Day, where we are focusing on disinformation. Uh, this webinar is, is uh, part of uh, Youth, uh, Youth of Truth Day, I'm sorry. It's part of Truth Day, where we take a moment to um, look at what's going on in media related to disinformation. And today, we are talking to a leading expert in disinformation campaigns, as well as online extremism, media manipulation, all of that. And that is uh, Dr. John, Dr. Joan Donovan, who is the research director at the Sherenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard School. Uh, Joan, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Okay, so- My house. Of yes, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanna just let you know, Joan, that I really appreciate you uh, speaking with us here. Um, I have seen you all over talking to um, lots of people on TV, online, and uh, you've even testified before Congress a couple of times, right? Including last week, I believe. Yeah, last week, I was a, it, was, it was weird. <laughs> right, right. And the reason we wanna do this is because in, while we're in the midst of this very heated uh, political campaign for president, uh, that's when you see more of the disinformation and misinformation going out. A lot of it is meant to, to confuse vo uh, voters, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, right now, more than anything, um, I think, you know, I call it the Olympics of disinformation, which is to say that, you know, it's going to be a couple weeks of serious trials. And um, we've seen different styles of attack, different kinds of uh, campaign operators, uh, misinformation, which is just intention. It's just false information without intention. When we talk about disinformation, we're talking about intentionally false information that is shared uh, specifically to reach some kind of political end. And so right now, because it's October, it's before an election in the US context, we see this happen before elections in, in most uh, countries that have social media and broad access to the internet at this stage because uh, the tactics really are amenable. And right now, unfortunately, the thing that um, media manipulators and disinformers really thrive on are is highly polarized environments where people are very skeptical, yeah. uh, which leads to some susceptibility issues in terms of believing things that may otherwise just be nonsensical. And I, I mentioned that it's intended to fool uh, voters, mm -hmm. but it's also some of it is intended to, to fool journalists, right? Yeah, one of the main tactics of media manipulators is to try to what they call trade up the chain, which is to take a story or invent a story and get a journalist to cover it that's in a outlet, um, either that is struggling to fill storylines, finding something novel and unique, or more often than not, a place that has very, very low editorial standards. And then by virtue of getting into a storyline, then trying to circulate the story through social media where someone of note, someone newsworthy, like a politician will retweet it. And then journalists will see it and think, well, that was dumb <laughs> and write a story about it. And most journalists don't realize that that's by design. There's a great book oh, by oh, Ryan Holiday called Trust Me, I'm Lying. That's worth checking out. So those who are sorting the disinformation win when the journalists do that, right? That, that's what Well, they, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough call. I think a lot of journalists over the last several years have become incredibly adept at seeing this and spotting it and, tr and trying not to. Other times they get, um, they might feel pressure from their assigning editor or that everybody else is covering it. And so they decide, okay, well, we'll cover it. Um, it might be a minor story. But the more coverage, mm -hmm. the more amplification, the more powerful the disinformation narrative becomes, and then the more difficult it is to tell the truth or to, or to even debunk it. Right. When we spoke last week, you mentioned something about um, how 
trending topics are manipulated. Can mm -hmm. you just explain what you meant by that? Yeah, so one of the things that, um, you know, 2011, 2012 and social media, you'd see social movements figured out really early on that you could make something trend on Twitter by virtue of having a bunch of people tweet it, right? And so that's actually kind of hard to do to have a couple thousand people tweet about the same thing at once when it's coming from nowhere. So right. we've seen media manipulators develop different tactics to do that, including registering a bunch of automated accounts and trying to engineer it, um, or by pretending to be uh, what we call the butterfly attack, which is that they will and this takes a while to do, but they will mimic the patterns of behavior of a certain social group and then eventually try to take over that group and get them to do, um, to, 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 to launch a campaign. Um, and what they know is if they can get something into trending topics, there's a, a likelihood that journalists will cover it, even if just to say, look at this crazy thing that trended. So, for instance, uh, we saw the conspiracy network of QAnon really jump into action when uh, Jeffrey Epstein's body was found. They wanted people to tweet Epstein didn't kill himself and spent a really long time uh, going across networks through message boards, um, trying to get people to continuously hammer uh, social media platforms with this hashtag to the point where it became a meme. And now it's, it's sort of a thing that people say when they want to be ridiculous online. But at that same exact time, we saw a bunch of other um, hashtags trend that were trending artificially, including things like Clinton body count. So when things like this happen, um, it helps the cause of the people who are behind these campaigns in some way, right? Aren't, well, yeah. Aren't, I, it, well, this, it gives them more exposure and that helps in their recruiting, right? Is that, is that? Yeah, to some degree. So in some instances, you have to think a little bit about the intent and the outcome. So some of these groups uh, that we study um, are misogynist white supremacist groups and they are definitely trying to uh bring people into the fold it's not the kind of recruitment where we would talk about oh you know they're they're like a card carrying member um you know in you know, early days of the kkk that was very much the case like people actually carried cards that said they were a member now with online groups when we talk about recruitment what we're talking about is people that are uh, comfortable with these ideas and may actually go and do something uh, that they otherwise wouldn't. And so one of the things that's really preoccupied me uh, throughout this pandemic is the way in which some people have um, really put their life on the line because they believe child sex trafficking is such an important issue that they need to go out in public and protest to raise awareness. And that's a lot that has a lot to do with um, this networked conspiracy group QAnon going into uh, save the children groups and planting the seed of this conspiracy theory, but also trying to get people riled up about this issue so that they can grow their ranks. Right. So how 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 uh, is is media. Um, misinformation or disinformation um, amplified inadvertently by journalists. Uh, does that happen much? That journalists help amplify the disinformation or misinformation that's coming out? So here's a good example, sort of like Law & Order SVU style, ripped from the headlines, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, last week, or was it last week? Yeah, the New York Post article about Hunter Biden's laptop probably would have landed with a giant thud uh, online if right. not for the moderation of co uh, the content moderation of platform companies, which really became the story. And it's interesting because uh, I don't want to only talk about 
journalists with some kind of ethics, right? <laughs> like we're talking about journalists with, uh, you know, that, that kind of has this here comes everybody approach. And so when it comes to the New York Post, uh, like them or not, they're, they've been around a long time. You kind of know what you get. And a story like this within the newsroom was kind of interesting because most people wouldn't put their byline on it. Right. Like most journalists did not want to touch this. And so they had to get someone that uh, reportedly in the New York Times, the byline was for a woman who had formerly been uh, working for Sean Hannity and had at, hadn't actually written a New York Post story and then had three that day, but reportedly she didn't even know her name was on it. And so there are ways in which I think news organizations and journalists uh, do play into this because they know that some of these stories will just generate a lot of money and will generate a lot of attention. Um, but by and large, I think what's hard about this moment is that we uh academics and journalists alike feel a responsibility to tell the truth and so sometimes we'll get sucked into writing about or talking about a debunk when it might have been a better idea not to say anything at all right right okay um i want to just encourage the people who are uh, watching us today if you have questions for dr uh, donovan to uh put them in the uh in the Q&A. And if you have comments, you can put that in, in the chat. Um, so what can journalists do to not, you know, help these groups that are trying to, to sow uh, disinformation? What, what, can, what, what can we do? What do we look out for? How do we prevent from, prevent from, you know, further amplifying information that's incorrect and from just getting um, sucked into, you know, falling for, for um, the campaigns that look real? Um, it's a good question. I think that uh, the issue is essentially that um, when journalists are making their determinations about how to write a story and what to write about, they have to think about, has this story impacted the audience that, you know, reads our paper or reads our, our website? Um, and they also have to think about the ways in which that information arrived in front of them. One of the ways we see media manipulators cultivate journalists is, you know, for a while they would just slide into the journalist DMs and be like, hey, did you see this? Uh, but now they're becoming much more savvy. They might get into your reply stream and make it really hard for you to ignore something because they are replying. The people that are uh, retweeting or commenting on your article see it and you're just like, wait, like, what is this piece of information or what is this video or what is this image of? And so some of these disinformers do this technique that they call news spamming. That's what that is, is they get into this into the replies of different reporters. Reporters might think that they're the only one seeing this information, especially if it has the aura of a scoop. It becomes really hard to ignore. We've seen media manipulators, for instance, this is a pretty funny story, actually, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, someone had made a uh, lab test result saying that Joe Biden had caught coronavirus. And this was right around the time that a bunch of people were tweeting, where's Joe, where's Joe, sleepy Joe. And so there was a weekend that he had taken some time off. They were re retrofitting his basement where the big joke about his basement comes from uh, to be a, a more of a live stream studio. Uh, and he was going to be doing some, some speeches from, from there. And uh, people were, suspect of his absence. And that pro provided an opening for media manipulators to fabricate evidence and forgeries. And so this document uh, hits Twitter and there's not much interest in it. Most people know it's a forgery. There's artifacts of uh, Photoshop and things, you know, like the fonts don't really match. And then this person's kind of so frustrated with it not going anywhere that they email every single reporter at BuzzFeed with a kind of like, did you see this email? Um, and of course, people at BuzzFeed do talk to each other. <laughs> and so they all knew that they were all being spammed with this. 
Um, but we do see that kind of finesse. It's not just a information drop. We see a kind of strategy at work. And so for journalists, you have to be sure that when you see these stories, if you're writing about them, we recommend that you use, you know, the truth sandwich model, just fact, fallacy, fact. So you tell the fact of the story, you make sure your headline tells the fact of the story. And then you tell the misinformation and perhaps even reveal the motivations for the for the disinformation or misinformation. And then you restate the facts. And that's a good way to try to get your audience to remember the thing that is true, which is often not that interesting. The reason why a lot of this uh, resonates online is because our online environment is built for things that are fast and uh, fresh and relevant, whereas the truth is labored, it's cumbersome, it requires a bit of nuance, and it's really boring. Um, which is why we have to be really careful about the uh, picking up things that, you know, are tantalizing or, or play into our, our best, uh, I guess, our worst instincts, right? Where, you know, sensationalism and scandal is something that we all love. I mean, I love gossip, but it doesn't make, um, it doesn't make for true news. So um, there, there have been you are also, you're an expert in media manipulation. And I think most of us have probably seen some of that, some video that was not what it uh, purported to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I assume that, that all of the, all of the um, software and technology that's out there to do things that are fun and clever are either done just to prove they're created or invented just to prove that I can do it, or maybe there's some commercial purpose, or maybe it's just to have fun, but um, it ends up being used for nefarious purposes. Nobody starts out creating, let's say, artificial intelligence just for, you know, these bad reasons, do they? Or Um. am I being naive? (laughs) <laughs> I know it ends up like well, I, it's 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 hard because we got to talk now. We got to talk about um, you know really what built the internet, the first major industry uh, driving innovation was pornography, right. and that's really what's behind deep fakes. Is that people want very very realistic um, pornography of celebrities, and so there was a. I think they changed their name recently, but they used to be called Deep Trace Labs. And they issued a report last year that 96% of deep fakes online are uh, pornographic in nature. So let me just tell you a little bit about what deep fakes are, though. So deep fakes come from the name of a, a guy on Reddit whose name was Deep Fake. And what he was is he's um someone who was a bit of a hobbyist developing AI technology that could take images of people and put them onto other people's bodies. And so the event that happened, like whether it's, you know, putting someone's face on uh, um, someone in a very scandalous uh, and revealing video or putting somebody's face on Jim Carrey's face from the mask or something, you can do anything you want with it. Um, requires those two two elements. You have to have a bunch of pictures of a single individual. So if you wanted to make, if I wanted to make a deep fake of you, Rod, I'd need about 30 images of you. Mm-hmm. And then they run it through a computer processing algorithm that then maps the face onto these bodies. And when corporations have picked it up, like Adobe and Microsoft, they say, well, it's going to make for really great movies because Every movie now can be translated into any language and you don't have to look at all this like really terrible dubbing. Uh, It's going to be great for people uh, who are hard of hearing that read lips. And uh, but the thing about the motivation to do uh, technologies, to make technologies, uh, you know, I think you're right in the sense some people are just doing it because they they want to see if it if it works. And we're also in this situation where there's a company that's a multi, multi multi-million dollar company that's making software that can generate 
um, essentially right now it can generate a pretty realistic eighth grade essay on American government. But these read fakes, right, being able to generate an entire article without actually having to have an author are based on content from the internet where it's lacing together probabilities of words. And so you can tell the machine uh, a sentence or two and then it will generate, you know, 800 word article on that topic. And that has the capacity to ruin everything online because uh, you can imagine what comment sections are going to look like, what AI generated news is going to look like. I mean, uh, you know, talk about color and flair, right? <laughs> it's going to disappear. But okay. yeah, so the, the ways in which our technology is starting to shift into this kind of eerie automation, um, not to get too Halloween-y about it, but um, yeah, it does, it does, uh, it makes me think twice about what the what the purpose is. So I actually found some deep fakes uh, online that I thought would be interesting for us to show today. Um, these are images. So apparently um, artificial intel intelligence can create people out of thin air. You familiar with that? Yes. Okay, it so can go, you can generate some of these at this person does not exist. I think it's dot com. I can't remember. But yeah, there's a website where you can. That's where I got these from. Yeah. And yeah. they, and you know, so people will make fake reporters and they'll put these pictures on them and they'll give them a fake byline because when you do reverse image search, it right. doesn't come up with nobody. And so one of the ways in which we used to detect manipulation early on would be to see, does this person even exist? And this technology Man, it really changed the game. Well, the two people on the screen, one is real and one was created out of thin air. So I'm just curious, with you looking at this, can you tell which is real and which was uh, you know, computer generated? I'm gonna go with uh, my girl with the long hair. You think that's the one that's computer They're generated? They're both beautiful, but I, ha I have a couple of reasons why, but. Um, okay, let's see, let's see if you're right. second ah so you're right the one on the left is real all right give me another one i like this game okay how about this oh this one is this one is two degrees harder and i'll tell people why yeah afterwards hmm those are some good looking teeth <laughs> on the older woman yeah. so i'm uh, i'm uh, I'm going to go with her. I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go the one with on the left. And you're uh, saying that yeah, she the is longer the, hair, the Asian. She's woman. Fake. Yeah. She's real. She's real. Yeah, yeah. That's who I thought was real. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought the little kid was a faker. It's because the teeth are very, very hard to make from AI because most people don't smile with their teeth. And so when they try to generate fake faces, you'll see abnormalities in the, in the mouths and in the ears and in the shadows around the neck. So the shadows around the neck and the ears were where I was looking for the last person. And then the teeth on this was something that um, this little girl, which it shouldn't have a lot of teeth. I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, kids, kids do, do have pretty, <laughs> pretty insane dental issues. Uh, but yeah, that was what I was, I was honing in on. Okay. Let's look at one more. Hmm. hmm. This one is tough. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen. I went through thing. about, I went through about, I don't know, 60 of these. Yeah. Looking at them. And I actually got pretty good about, because I can see little details, uh, sort of like you, I think, in determining what's real, what's fake, but you know, to a typical person, you know, mm -hmm. you look at this, who, who hasn't, you know, studied this and looked at 60 of them. And when they find out that they're wrong, they look at, you know, the reasons that, you know, wh why they possibly were wrong. But go with the you can really fool somebody with this. Fake. You, you think the kid is fake? The kid is fake. You know, this is one of the ones that I got wrong. 
Yeah. And you probably said the kid for the same reason I did, because his face is so symmetrical and it has a, uh, a blurry background that's pretty easy to do. It's not complex. And yeah. then you look at the guy on the left and it looks like he's sweating. You know, he has like a- That was it for me is the, is the sweating. Yeah, I was- got I never seen his it eyes, made of- unshaven. I mean, you know, it's, but, but, you know, this guy was totally generated using um, artificial intelligence. And then when you think about, when you think about how this type of tech technology can be used and, you know, it's sort of like what you were saying about how um, you can, you take 30 something pictures and you can have them, you know, saying whatever you want mm -hmm. um, and it looks real. There's a, I'm gonna do one other little thing. It's not so much a game, but you know, Joe Rogan, the um, comedian and podcaster, his voice, the voice that you would hear here sounds like Joe Rogan, but it's not, none of this is real. Friends, I've got something new to tell all of you. I've decided to sponsor a hockey team made up entirely of chimps. I'm tired of people telling me that chimps are not capable of kicking human ass in sports. Chimps are just superior athletes, and these chimps have been working out hard. They're throwing kettlebells, battle ropes, everything. I've got them on a strict diet of bone broth and elk meat. These chimps will rip your balls off. God damn, it's impressive. All I got to say is, see you on the ice, folks. Wow. No, there's more. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was this part where he was doing tongue twisters, but um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is um, interesting. But I, I had not thought about that, that you can actually, because if you listen to him, it, it doesn't sound like they stitched together little bites of uh, sound. It sounds like this guy's talking. Right. Yeah. And that's the advantage here, right? Is that the technology itself allows you to type in words and what it's done uh, in terms of the machine learning model, it's broken down elements of speech. It's not broken down words. It's broken down sounds. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it, it can place those words together and create different intonation for them and can smooth out those rough edges. If you were to try to, you know, uh, any audio engineer, or people that have had to do this, you know, know that it yeah. sounds terrible if you try to slice up, you know, every third or fourth word to try to make someone say what you want them to say. But this technology of audio impersonation, we're really afraid as researchers that uh, something like this will be deployed across uh, social media where it's going to sound as if, you know, Trump's taking a bribe uh, and it's going to sound as if he's in conversation with, uh, you know, Putin or whoever. Right. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening, and I think this is kind of interesting philosophically, Danielle Citron writes about this as the liar's dividend, which is to say that it pays to, uh, to know these technologies exist because you can then say, well, I never said that, right? And if these technologies had been really developed uh, earlier on, say in 2016, when the, the famous um, uh, audio recording of Trump had come out, which he is now sometimes, uh, you know, just deflected as saying, I don't even remember saying that, is it even me, right? Um, but it does introduce uh, more benefits for, for the manipulator than it does for society, which is, I wrote about this in a paper with Britt Paris um, about deep fakes and cheap fakes, because really what it does is it troubles the notion of evidence. And this is where it's going to impact journalists, which is to say that we struggle a lot, uh, journalists and academics, with getting evidence of a thing. And when that evidence could be impersonated uh, or could be made up out of whole cloth, it's going to be that much more harder to convince our audiences uh, of especially our uh, very important investigative pieces where we have really um, 
been able to source uh, uh, things that nobody else has. And it's that novelty that is also going to be a liability if people think maybe it was faked. Have you seen uh, any of this technology that we just uh, showed? Have you seen that being used in um, uh, campaigns? Not necessarily this one, but in any political campaigns. Are we that far yet that people are doing that? Um, it's a good question. We've definitely seen what we call cheap fakes, which is just your regular roads, audio mm -hmm. editing, you know, video editing. Uh, one video that uh, was very recent was um, Biden had come out. Biden is kind of the king of gaffes, I have to say. So he, he this happens to him a lot yeah. where he he will often do the thing where he will repeat something that someone else said. And then people will just click clip that piece and make it seem like he's saying it, which is it, you can't do that this day and age when people are uh, purposefully trying to misrepresent you. Mm -hmm. But he came out in one of his uh, stump speeches. It was like Latinos for Biden or something. And he puts his phone up to the microphone and he starts dancing and he's playing this, um, this hit song by the person, the, the artist who had actually just introduced him. And later that, uh, or the next day, you start to see a video circulating online of Biden coming up, putting his phone up to the microphone, and it's playing NWA's F the Police. Yeah. And Trump retweets it. And it, he wrote something like, China is drooling, right? And so the way in which it, if it remains as a meme, and it's funny, because it's coming from, and you see that it's coming from an account that is traditionally kind of subversive and funny and satire that's one thing but when it's been decontextualized and is now being shared by the pre president of the united states without any um any in inkling that it has been edited um that changes the game enormously and mm -hmm. so that's one of the big struggles for people in our field as well as struggles for platform companies is how do you either reintroduce context through labeling or do you just start deleting this stuff because it's uh, potentially, you know, um, misrepresentative uh, and in a moment of uh, an election, it, it could potentially, you know, I mean, I don't think it's going to sway people's voting outcomes, right. but it does, uh, it just leaves people feeling really uncomfortable. Well, it's kind of scary to know that the potential is out there to create things that look really, really real that can, because, you know, we are in a, a time where, I don't know, I've never seen this level of uh, disinformation and misinformation circulating. And so you have that, then you have this technology that can allow you to alter people's voices, to uh, alter people's faces in very sophisticated looking ways, very realistic. And it just scares me that, you know, if we're not there now, that that's where we're, we're going with um, in some of these political campaigns. Mm -hmm. I do have a question that I want to, that someone just asked that I want to pose to you. It says, in, in what ways can we analyze media texts uh, to see if they are truly factual or disinformation? It's a good question. So I'm going to point you to our new website at mediamanipulation.org. Uh, there we have a method section, and I would highly uh, recommend a piece written by one of my uh, most beloved co-thinkers, Brian Friedberg, um, this piece, Di Investigative Digital Ethnography. Our okay. jobs uh, as researchers um, now line up with some of the techniques of online investigative journalists, uh, computer assisted journalism as it used to be called, right? But, um, and so if you look at this, uh, this uh, essentially instruction guide, it can help you set up what we call a monitoring environment, which mm -hmm. is you have to let the algorithms do the work. So you wanna have a fresh browser, a browser that you don't use for anything else. You wanna set up a bunch of accounts on different platforms and you wanna start looking at the topics that are interesting to you. 
and you want to start looking not just at news you like to read, but both news that is um, partisan news, as well as news that is clickbaity news, news that is in aggregators. And you want to get a pretty good sense of what's out there, right? You have to know what the scene is to know more or less what is being hoaxed. And then the next thing you want to do is um, kind of season those algorithms by uh, clicking on things, watching things, uh, letting it recommend you things. If you're using YouTube, for instance, a YouTube algorithm, if you are interested in understanding more about um, the kinds of stories that say, for instance, white nationalists tend to get involved in hoaxing, you know, you'd want to watch some of the people who are influential on those platforms that are these horrible people. Um, that's, that's all to say that disinformation comes from somewhere and it is a kind of beat in and of itself. And the way that you then discover it is by looking through these techniques, looking for these techniques and looking for people who are, you know, by and large doing the, what we might call a, a two thirds true approach to the world, which is they've got two thirds of the stuff they serve up as things everybody already knows. And then one third of it is total garbage. The other thing I recommend is watching sites like Gateway Pundit because, uh, or Law Enforcement Today, because those sites often will do the two thirds true model. And when they do launch a disinformation campaign, it tends to start off small. And then it grows and it grows and it grows over time. And then a week or two later, if a celebrity or someone newsworthy starts to retweet it, that's when we start to see it really jump in popularity. And so really uh, disinformation comes in all different kinds of flavors and the pr approach that you would use for different platforms requires you to use different tools uh, and different theories uh, of how information moves across those platforms. But if you look closely at the case studies on our website, you can also get a really good sense of how we do it because we try to cite everything that we are using as evidence. And so you can kind of re-piece those cases back together and get a really good education in how different kinds of um, breaking news events prevent, present different kinds of manipulation opportunities. I'll give you an example. One of the most often used trolling campaigns is anytime there is a horrible shooting, a horrible mass shooting, you will see first out the gate an identification of a guy called Sam Hyde, who is um, someone who's likes to be labeled a mass shooter and thinks it's funny. And he kind of makes his money on being this really edgy online comedian. He even went as far as to take pictures of himself with dyed blonde hair and an AK um, or an AR-15. And uh, so you'll see this meme that says he can't keep getting away with this and it'll be pictures of him. He's been named 19 different times as a shooter by major news organizations uh, before people realized that this was a hoax that was being carried out over and over and over again. And so if you look at the kind of case studies that we've put together in our first round of case studies, and there will be many more, and there's opportunities for journalists to write some, so please get in touch with us if you have a case study you want to write up. Um, you can look at the tactics and get a sense of, you know, maybe there is some kind of hoaxing going on here. Um, Rod, if you'll permit me one other example to tell here. Um, I'll tell you an example about what happened yesterday, which is um, civil society groups had started sending me texts saying, where people are sending us screenshots of an email that looks like it came from the Proud Boys saying, we know you're a registered Democrat. We have access to the voting infrastructure. You must change your registration to uh, vote for Trump. We're watching. And this email came from info at officialproudboys.com. And the only evidence we had of it were screenshots. And so for me as a researcher, I thought, hmm, screenshots, pretty low bar. It's very easy to fake a screenshot. It's very easy to change 
words and a screenshot of a tweet to make it look like someone said something they didn't. And so for me, this kind of campaign, I was very suspect that uh, it might be relying on media attention to it in order to make it seem like a bigger deal than it really was. So we started looking into it, digging around, looking at the different uh, metadata associated with officialproudboys.com, which uh, apparently had been recently transferred as a domain. So it looked as if the Proud Boys had actually lost control of their website um, about a week ago or two weeks ago. And so there did seem to be maybe some kind of um, shenanigans afoot. And then as we started seeing on social media, more and different screenshots, that's key, which is more people had gotten emails, more people were posting screenshots. And even though it was the same email, we knew that someone had essentially spammed a group of people because we started to see uh, the same hoax in multiple different places from people who weren't connected with one another. And so civil society organizations decided that they were going to contact through their get out the vote networks, uh, um, voters in their areas, especially Florida and Alaska, and just let them know that there's no imminent threat. There's no threat of harm, that this is an email hoax. And then later last night, uh, the we saw government officials come out and say, we looked into this. It appears as if it's either Iran or Russia that had spoofed the email uh, address and sent out these messages. And for them, we know much of the rationale behind this is just to create chaos, just to add another layer of um, another layer of uh, I just want to use the word crazy because that's all I can <laughs> think about right now. Um some people uh, had reported, right, that that their that these emails had personal information about them, like their addresses, and and that they knew that they were Democrats, right? Well, I don't know if they had addresses. I didn't see any ones that said that, but they did know that they were they were Democrats, and it does appear as if some of the email addresses had come from what we know are voter rolls that are available for sale on um, identity theft websites. Uh, and so there are, uh, you know, um, they're not necessarily even that hard to find, but there are dark web spaces that have just buckets and buckets of data for sale. And why uh, someone's voter registration record might be useful is if you're trying to line up, say, say you've got a bunch of logins for Target, for instance, but in order to verify uh, and gain access to someone's account, you need something specific about them, like their birthday or like their address. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see people will buy buckets of huge buckets of information, personal information, so that they can create um, very robust identity theft uh, uh, kits. And, and so it's, it seems as if that's where the information had come from. So in the last election, we heard a lot about, um, about Russia uh, interfering in the election and using social media to, to um, send out messages to people, uh, get people to, um, to, 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 to forward and share um, um, different memes and content that was either you know, pro-Trump or anti-Hillary, uh, and and they tied some of them with uh, specific groups. So, um, I heard somebody say, somebody, I think somebody said this to me um, four years ago. They they ask, so they're saying that I, I'm that Russia is you know, sending me all these, uh, these memes and, and, and images, but I haven't received any. And the person couldn't understand how, how this whole thing was supposed to work. They're like, Russia isn't influenced me, isn't influencing me. So I just wanna know, can you just explain how the Russian campaign actually um, was intended to work to prompt people to 
you know, whatever the goal was to vote for one candidate over another, or just to throw their hands up and say, I'm not going to voting, or just say, I don't trust the elections, or whatever the goal was, how, how was this supposed to work? So what we know about um, Russian interference in tradecraft around, uh, like, inter internet, um, internet, like online tactics is that they try to play both sides. Um, they know that if you can take an issue and drive polarization, take a wedge issue and really split people so much on a specific topic that they do not see any resolution possible besides fighting with one another, um, that's where in, in, in those environments creating uh, a feeling of apathy. So voter apathy is one of the outcomes uh, of uh, media manipulation tactics like that. So in 2015, uh, there were a, ma a, a massive pages, somewhere around 150 so on Facebook, uh, different accounts on Twitter and Instagram as well, that were on both sides of very uh, polarizing issues in, in the U.S. So pro-black, anti-black, uh, racist, anti-black racist, uh, pro-patriot, anti-patriot, pro-trans, anti-trans. They even pretended to be a trans teenager who was like fighting with their parents. Um, and, but the idea is to get people who are passionate about certain social issues all into the same group and over time then try to convince them that the U.S. government is trash, it doesn't really represent you, it's not even worth your time to go vote, the election is fixed anyway. Um, and so when people went back and, and did an autopsy of that moment, what the researchers really found was that Russia was using both a combination of using organic posting, that is posts that people would would see and share with automated advertising and targeted advertising to grow their pages. And so some of them um, that grew pretty large tended to be uh, black activist pages. And at that time, um, Black Lives Matter was also um, probably not as um, active as it is today, but was still a very significant proportion of the way in which people were receiving news and political opinion. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine if, if Russia is pretending to be Black Lives Matter online and is sowing a kind of narrative around Hillary Clinton, especially amplifying the, uh, the thing she did say, which was the super predator comment, that they're using that that kind of narrative to really push people in a very particular kind of direction. And they were able to reach millions and millions of Americans with this messaging because of the way Facebook is built and because of how cheap it is to use Facebook in this way. And so now uh, Facebook has instituted different checks and balances within their products to make it a, a, a lot harder actually to make fake accounts and to make them in mass but it still happens okay we're almost out of time but there is one question that i did want to uh, get across to you that came through it says um, do you have suggestions for journalists on reporting or deciding to report on disinformation involving hate speech mm. It's a good question. I care a lot about this topic. I've written extensively about this topic. And a lot of it online. A lot of it's already out there. Yep. Um, well, everything's out there. I, I, I forego writing a book as an academic, even though it's like the thing we're all known for, because I just feel like things we need to know, we need to know them now. But in the things that I've written about, um, this notion of strategic silence. I went back um, with Dana Boyd and did a, a history of the ways in which different press treated white supremacists in the 60s and 70s. Now, the black press, not to be surprised at all by this, did not entertain the KKK as some kind of business organization that is, you know, just trying to do good by the people. The black press, by and large, 
reported on the KKK only when they had to and reported uh, on the infighting and the, and the, um, and the follies of the KKK and the, the arrests, not necessarily what we saw in the white press, which was we saw a lot of people reporting on uh, the events that they would stage for media optics, torch marches, cross burnings, lynchings, um, uh, big parades where they're all wearing the, the robes. But it took a concerted effort by journalists in the South to rethink how they were going to cover um, the KKK. And they started using uh, what later was labeled as strategic silence. That is, if you're a photojournalist and your editor says, go out and get me pictures of this, you know, cross burning and you conveniently forget your camera and you come back and you say, oh, I forgot I got there. I forgot my camera, but it was not not a big deal. Right. And so maybe it gets less coverage and journalists really had to come up with ways to um, cover the civil rights movement as well, um, which really taught them a lot about their role in society, which is that journalists realize that they that they set the agenda, they set the public conversation, they set the tone. And when we were dealing with the rise of the alt right in 2015, it was if journalists had kind of lost part of that history and we also had a new thing to contend with, which is that white supremacists online were adept at using social media to get noticed. And they were really good at getting journalists to pay attention to them as well as using some of the conventions of journalism against um, against themselves, getting journalists to, to, you know, go up to them and say, you know, tell me who you are. Oh, you're the alt-right. Okay. I'm going to call you the alt-right instead of calling you a bunch of white supremacists. Oh, you, are you a bunch of white supremacists? No, you sure? No. Okay. I'm going to quote you as saying you're not a white supremacist. Right. And it, that kind of reporting actually led to a significant amount of recruitment into this movement that was growing in size, not just online, but in person. Uh, Whitney, it mainstream, I, I, what? I it helped to make it mainstream, right? It helped uh, to make it mainstream. It well, helped to make Richard. Maybe that's going too far to say that it's mainstream, but it gave it more legitimacy. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And Richard Spencer, you know, became this household name because he was the guy that would be willing to to have these conversations in public. And he was a very good speaker. Um, but over time, journalists started talking to each other on this beat and they started to realize, oh, does this white supremacist send you texts late at night and think you're getting this scoop? And, and so once journalists on this beat realized that they were being cultivated, they were all uh, sort of thinking they were getting special privileges and access and information, mm -hmm. and they were just getting worked by these white supremacists to give them more coverage, they started to rethink it. And, um, and it was really only after Charlottesville that journalists uh, understood the power you all have, the power that journalists have to platform these folks, to bring them into being and to give them you know, the space to, to say the things that they want to say in the way they want to say it. And so I've been a big advocate of getting journalists to rethink their approach to um, writing about white supremacists and to get journalists to also focus on what we call impact stories or impact zones. If, if it is truly a story where these white supremacists are disrupting businesses, tell that story. If, if they're disrupting uh, local organizers, if they're trying to dox uh, immigrants, those are important stories to tell. The point isn't to go radio silent. The point is to be strategically silent about letting them tell your audiences what they want your audiences to hear, but really doing the work that journalists demand in this moment of journalists, uh, the work that is demanded of journalists in this moment to describe it for what you see and for what it is so that they aren't allowed to manipulate and they're not allowed to, um, they're not allowed to sort of lay the tracks directly back to where they, you know, they hang out and, and the media they make is extensive. Uh, they have their own media ecosystem. And so it's really important that journalists see it for what it is and, and tell their uh, audiences and viewers what they need to know 
but do so in a way that's language that's familiar to you. Don't adopt their language just because that's how they want to be described. It's a good point. And, you know, I think newsrooms, there have to be conversations about whether to run stories at all Mm -hmm. about certain certain, um, hate speech that's out there. Well, um, Dr. Donovan, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Um, you know, I get to talk to you two weeks in a row. I feel really Hey, good. anytime, anytime you need me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of the work that SPJ has been doing. And I am, um, I, you know, it inspires my work. And when I talk about ethics, I talk about you guys. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm really honored. That. We really appreciate that. So, well, I want to thank the people who, joined in to listen to this discussion. Um, Sorry we didn't get to uh, ask all the questions that came in, but I I do think that we got some good information listening to you today. And um, so now we're just going to sit back and see what happens over the next uh, week and a half and uh, watch the debates tonight, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a live wire. Uh, I'd probably put the phone across the room and and just uh, hunker in. And uh, yeah. well, I guess the good news is that well, no, <laughs> the the campaign season is almost over. Yeah, uh, but uh, the disinformation continues beyond that. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. All right. No, thank you, uh, Doctor. Thank Donovan. you. Have a good day. You too. Have a good day. <laughs>